Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 681 of the podcast and it is Friday the 17th of March 2023 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Joseph Nassis, who writes across traditional and indie. He has multiple genres, has multiple streams of income, and he focuses both on craft and business, as well as how new technologies could impact his business and how he's embracing them. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing news, Draft Digital has opened up print functionality to everyone, and it includes converting your ebook to a print book with a click, turning your ebook cover into a wraparound print cover in seconds, pick from one of dozens of beautiful and professional interior layouts, distribute your print book worldwide to a growing network of retailers, and support for ordering author copies in 32 countries and counting. So if you go through draftedigital.com, you will have all of that right now with no setup costs, free ISBNs, a free change to your print book every 90 days since your last change, unlimited free changes on your ebooks, and Drafted Digital's celebrated, industry beloved, legendary author support. And this is only the start. Our roadmap includes adding in-demand features like hardcovers, large print editions, more industry standard trim sizes, more templates, more of everything. So that is pretty exciting from Draft to Digital. If you don't have your books in print or you want to expand your print, this is definitely uh, a possible option. So just go to drafttodigital.com and also the links as ever in the show notes. So in futurist stuff, (laughs) I have a few things to say. And uh, once again, it's not really futurist, it's more like right now. But the Future Today Institute launched their annual trend report this week, which I always look forward to. It is vast and it goes into all kinds of areas, bioengineering, artificial intelligence. Yes, you knew AI was going to be there. Climate and energy, financial services, government, security, space, healthcare and medicine, logistics, Web3, computing, entertainment, robotics, metaverse and more. Absolutely fascinating report. So if you're in any of those areas, obviously interesting to read. It's at futuretodayinstitute.com. Now, I have been through several of the sections that are relevant to us and picked out a few things, but you can download each of those separate reports uh, for free. You just have to register. Firstly, on the AI section, they've essentially moved AI to near term rather than something like quantum computing and the metaverse, which are moved further out. And that's certainly how it feels right now is that generative AI particularly is really taking off. And I have been saying for several years now, this is just awareness, you need to be aware of this, but don't worry, you can wait and get into it later. Well, I certainly think it is now the time. You can't really sit on the fence anymore. (laughs) Because as they say, from the report, AI is emerging as an assistant for all knowledge workers. Within the next 18 to 24 months, we will see assistive technology developed for a variety of professions and generative AI will be incorporated into consumer applications. In nearly every industry, AI will act as a force multiplier for growth, bringing efficiencies, better tracking, business intelligence and assistance with decision making. And this idea of the force multiplier is exactly how I feel about it. It is more leverage. I already use so many tools to leverage my one person business into reaching lots of people. But these AI tools will help me leverage even more. And this also relates to the Microsoft launch that just happened last night as I record this, where they have incorporated GPT-4 into a Microsoft 365 Copilot suite, which you can use to work in Microsoft Word, PowerPoint and Excel, Outlook, Teams and more. 
as they say, to unleash creativity, unlock productivity and up level your skills. And I certainly feel this. I really do feel this is exactly what's happening. Now, last year they implemented a co-pilot for coders and they now have data and it shows that among developers who use the co-pilot on GitHub, 88% say they are more productive. 77% say the tool helps them spend less time searching for information. And 74% say they can focus their efforts on more satisfying work. Now, this is, again, this is how I feel. This is These tools help me be more creative and more productive. I've also been playing with the GPT-4 model on ChatGPT, which is only in the premium version. And it is pretty darn cool, (laughs) to be honest. In the last few days, I've been trying it for various different things. I've used it as part of my fiction, ideation and writing process. I've also had it help me write a sales page for my Shopify store, which I'm starting to build out even further. I've also asked it to write me several different styles of press release aimed at different audiences for promoting Pilgrimage, my memoir, as well as help me with some ideas for a future solo episode, which is coming soon. So in terms of writing, and again, this is not like, here, write this for me and then use it like that. I mean, the solo episode I'm talking about will be next week, next week's show, which will be on my lessons learned from Kickstarter. Now, I already know a lot of my lessons learned from Kickstarter, but I do a written blog post, which I then format and do all that with and then I read it out. So this will of course be based on my lessons learned. This is not a generic blog post on Kickstarter lessons but I'm using it to help me expand my writing so I can be more productive and create that first draft and a lot faster basically. So um, in terms of writing one of the changes of GPT-4 is how much you can use in the input field so you can almost teach it a lot more as part of the prompt. So I started my chat with, what do you know about J.F. Penn's style of writing fiction? And GPT-4 came back with a list of the hallmarks of my fiction. And I asked it how it knew, and it's based on reviews, interviews, other available information on the web, not the books itself, not the books themselves. So then I said, expand this in the style of J.F. Penn and gave it a sentence of what I wanted. For example, Morgan approached the entrance to the catacombs, which were covered in unusual symbols. And then I used that to expand. I then said, expand this in the style of J.F. Penn and it expanded it to about 300 words, which, to be honest, were pretty similar to what I would write, (laughs) which did not happen with the previous version of GPT. And... So then I was like, okay, well, what might the symbols be based on Celtic mythology? Give me a list of 10 things that the symbols could be and use Celtic myths in the description. And it gave me a list. And then I went back and said, okay, now expand the description of the catacombs with this as the uh, design. And then I went on mid journey and made the design. I mean, seriously, I'm having so much fun. way too much fun actually I exploded my brain and I had to go for a long walk to clear my head I was also up at 3 a.m this morning my brain's buzzing I have so many ideas I finally feel like I'm going to be able to get my books into the world as like I literally have I have about 25 book ideas sitting in my drive that I want to create but uh, you know, this will, I think this will just help me. As I said, this is a, pr- a pr- productivity tool. It's a way to uh, leverage our creativity in more ways. And like I said, this does not, this is not going to write that book itself. And look, even if you, <laughs> I'm not encouraging you to do this, I wouldn't use another writer's name uh, in my style prompt, but you could use JF Pen, and you would still write a completely different book to me. But the other thing is, I don't mind either because you still have to sell it. <laughs> so this is going to expand the amount of writing, but it doesn't help the process of publishing, reaching readers, making a living writing. That is all about you connecting with readers, writing the books you love, writing in your voice. So don't use these tools to create fast, generic stuff. There is going to be a lot of that created by people who don't actually have ideas. (laughs) So, But if you create according to what you want to create in your voice, then 
it's going to be very cool. And I do have, in fact, I'm doing the interview this afternoon with a lawyer talking about a lot of the copyright stuff around AI that will be coming up in a few weeks. I also wanted to say, yes, of course. I mean, uh, to me, I'm, you can tell, I'm, I'm always excited about this. I'm on the side of positive and amazing, and this is going to change the world in amazing ways. But equally, like fire, like electricity, like the internet, people use these things for bad stuff and really bad stuff <laughs> as well as amazing stuff. So yes, it can hurt people, but also it can change the world. And would you be without fire, electricity or the internet? Uh, so yeah, I think this is going to become part of your daily life. And in fact, it already is, you know, AI is part of Amazon and Google and maps on your phone and social media and Netflix and Spotify and all these technologies we use every day already. So yes, I think it is a very exciting time and I think you have to start getting involved. <laughs> I'm I'm calling it, you can't sit on the fence anymore. Google also this week announced generative AI features coming to Google Docs, Gmail, Sheets and Slides, but they are coming out later this year. But the fact is, if you use MS Word, if you use Google Docs to write, these things will have generative AI in very soon. Back to the Future Institute report and some snippets around business models. So they have said subscription programs will battle economic headwinds and market saturation. We know about market saturation for sure. Inflation will put growing pressure on consumers to prioritise expenses. The temptation for publishers will be to fight churn exclusively with tried and true market tactics like discounting to get more subscribers in the door and price discrimination to earn more from a diminishing subscriber base. The way forward, however, is for publishers to seek real innovation for their core products to ensure continued relevance and the integrity of their value chain into the future. And this is why I'm not worried about a flood of AI generated or AI enhanced, sped up creative process. I'm not worried about it because the point is we have to differentiate and that is still by writing books in our voices and connecting with readers. And for me, the innovation I am putting into process is going direct more. So Kickstarter for special projects, Shopify, and essentially being more human, as I always talk about. So yes, I'm going to also, I'm really looking at my plan. Like I said, I've got all these books that I want to write. And a lot of them I've put off because they're too weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but now I'm just I'm just going to be weird. I'm going to be weird JF Pen. That's my future. In the next decade, weird JF Pen. Dark, dark little shadow in the corner. Uh, but the popularity of Wednesday on Netflix has really encouraged me. Uh, but yes, I, I will keep my books wide, but I will focus on direct first and doing more quirky things. Also in the report, the possibility of more interesting marketing, they say advances in generative AI have created production ready tools that can power multilingual translation, chatbots and personalization. Generative AI makes it easier to transform formats. Text can become audio. Audio can be paired with visuals to create video. Video can be summarised into text. This opens the door for creators to distribute content in formats and on platforms they might not otherwise have explored. So yes, as I said, I've been pasting descriptions from my books into Midjourney and enjoying the images it creates for them, but we'll soon be able to do text to video and that will be even more exciting. On this AI stuff, I also want to recommend Monica Lionel. She has a new, I always rock, recommend Mon what Monica does, but she has a great newsletter, Ethical AI Publishing, which is on Substack. There's only a few uh, essays so far, but they're really good essays, rounding up a lot of what I've been hinting at over the last few years, including an article on the impact all of this might have on copyright and the potential change in what becomes valuable. Again, she emphasises authenticity, human touch, building a fandom that cares about you, treasures your work and is willing to pay for it. And that is why I'm, I mean, I have plans for photo books, like I love taking photos. Um, I want to do, oh, there's so much I want to do that is around 
build, you know, building products that people will actually treasure, products that people will treasure around books I want to write that will be interesting to a niche audience. So yeah, so interesting. And as I often say, double down on being human. Think about the opportunities of this time and what's coming and how you can use these tools to leverage and accelerate what you want to create and how you can be more you in your writing and marketing. In my personal update, we had a long weekend in southwest Wales last weekend. It was wet and windy and wild, (laughs) but we also managed to visit some gorgeous little windswept chapels and also St. David's Cathedral, which is incredible. It's one of those places, you know, I love Memento Mori, Remember You Will Die. And it is one of those places that you go and it's not just humans that die, it's also powers. (laughs) And you go to St. David's and you're like, wow, this was the centre of a really powerful uh, church empire at one point. And now it's just this tiny little village in the southwest of Wales with this enormous cathedral and a ruined palace. The bishop's palace is in ruins and it, it, the, it's so big. <laughs> so have a look at the pictures. They're on uh, my Instagram and Facebook at JF Penn Author. If you like Gothic cathedrals as I do, you will enjoy that. Also this week, obviously, I've been playing with GPT-4 and Shopify, but I also launched my online course on writing, setting and sense of place. And in fact, uh, in one of the lessons about how to help you uh, with sensory detail, I do include PseudoWrite and the GPT tools as such, ChatGPT. So, uh, The course description. Are you struggling to bring your story setting to life? Are you finding it difficult to transport your readers to the world you've created, whether that's fiction, memoir or narrative nonfiction? Do you find yourself writing a lot of dialogue, but not quite nailing where it's taking place? If yes, this course will help you take your writing craft to the next level. You'll learn how to use sensory details, character perspective, as well as metaphor, symbolism and theme to create a setting that is both believable and captivating. You'll explore how to research settings, how to use setting to drive plot, plus explore aspects of world building, as well as learn editing tips and ways to use setting in book marketing. There are optional writing exercises you can do throughout and questions to consider with each lesson. And it's available at thecreativepen.com forward slash learn. Uh, And there's also the AI assisted author, (laughs) which is funny. I mean, I did create that over a year ago, but it's about principles behind AI. And someone just left a review today saying that it has really helped them. So yes, thecreativepen.com forward slash learn for my courses. And it's really been a busy week because I also launched, or with a demon's eye, my short story, uh, which is now available wide. Uh, so it's ebook and audiobook, and it is now on my store creativepenbooks.com and also on every other store you can possibly imagine. So you can always, and I narrated the audio. So I'll read you this too. How far would you go to see again? Conflict photographer Sarah Miles loves being embedded with the military out in the desert. Her pictures pay tribute to those who fight, suffer and die for freedom, and the images she captures can turn public perception in the never-ending war. Her photography matters. But when Sarah is caught in an explosion out on patrol, her eyes are damaged by a face full of shrapnel. She may never be able to see through a lens again. The military offers her a cutting-edge operation to restore her sight, but it comes with a price. And yes, ChatGPT helped me write that sales description. <laughs> and in fact, this is probably the gateway drug into using AI tools because you can go, you know, you can go to ChatGPT and you can use it. You can paste in your sales description and ask it to rewrite it, and it will very likely be better than yours. <laughs> And lots of people rewriting their entire backlist of sales descriptions at this point. Marketing writing is uh, something we're not so good at as as authors. But yes, it's a supernatural story. It's getting some good reviews. Mary says, I was not prepared for the astonishing punch of this brief masterpiece. Thank you, Mary. The first two thirds took me on a beautifully crafted ride and then pow, an ending that left me gasping. I'm very impressed and very scared. 
that is possibly one of the best reviews I've ever had, Mary. Thank you for that. And um, this, and in my author's note, I talk about where this story comes from. But if you've been listening a while, you'll know I had laser eye surgery a few years back. And that definitely was part of the inspiration for this story. There's something about lying under a machine as a laser... <laughs> sort of re-sculpts your eye that makes you think about these things. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Tomorrow Kiddo said, just bought Jeff's book on accessibility. This book is essential for all creators. Indeed. And that's why in the last show, when I talked um, in my introduction to the PseudoWrite episode, and I talked about how GPT-4 is powering this new app, which it, you essentially essentially hold it up and it can be your eyes this is brilliant. It's a visual input and a text output. And of course, then the text can be read aloud. So I, I sent it on to Jeff. And that's something more is that how how is this stuff going to help us? Uh, and I care very much about eyesight as it's something <laughs> like my short story, I worry about. Kay Moore said, listening to the show while hiking on the Sunshine Coast in Australia, happy to be part of the conversation and sent several pictures from the Sunshine Coast, which was lovely. I used to live near there uh, in Brisbane and we got married in Noosa. So I have very happy memories of that area. And Carol Westmore said, listening to your podcast at my favourite beach when this penguin came by and sent me a video of a penguin from a beach in South Africa, which was very, very cool. Thank you for that. And thanks to everyone who sends pictures of where you're listening. I love to know where you're listening. Please do. So you can tweet me at the creative pen with a double N. Send me pictures of where you're listening. Email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. And yes, I do love to hear what you think about the AI stuff. The only comments I delete are the ones that are particularly offensive or just don't think. I leave comments that are negative, like that are anti-AI, but are thoughtful. So I'm always happy to hear thoughtful comments <laughs> on anything. So today's episode is sponsored by Ingram Spark, which I use to print and distribute my self-published print books wide. Because with Ingram Spark, it's my content, but they help me do more with it. And in fact, right now, my print files for pilgrimage are up and on pre-order. So you can do pre-orders with print through Ingram, which is super handy. And I will have the 5x8 paperback and the large print through Ingram Spark. So if you publish through Ingram Spark, you will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools and universities, chain bookstores and more across a global network of distribu distributors, including bookstores like Foils, Blackwells and Waterstones in the UK, as well as Bookshop.org, Booktopia in Australia and New Zealand, Chapters Indigo in Canada, Walmart, Target and loads of independent stores in the USA. Of course, it means your book will be available to order, but you will still have to drive demand. But since having my books on Ingram Spark, I've had many pictures of my print books in libraries and I've sold them at book fairs, conventions and in physical stores. And in fact, if you request one of my print books from your library, it will come from Ingram Spark. And of course, you can do that. I encourage you to. <laughs> You can choose to use returns on Ingram Spark, but it's not necessary. And I don't do returns because I don't ever want to end up out of pocket. And you can choose your discount percentage. You can also bulk order, for example, if you're a speaker and you want back of the room copies or if you work direct with schools or bookstores. I have done several boxes of books sent to various places uh, or when bookstores order them from me. I order them myself on Ingram and get them printed and shipped to the location directly from the website. So if you want your books available for bookstores and libraries, schools and universities, go wide with your print books. And remember, you can publish with Ingram as well as other services. So I use Ingram alongside KDP Print and Book Vault for my Shopify store. So don't limit yourself. Go wide with your print books. It's your content. Do more with it. Head over to IngramSpark.com. 
So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my patrons, who also especially support the extra AI and other futurist episodes. And uh, we sometimes have chats about that in the comments within the Patreon. And I also have the extra Q&A where I often answer questions about this stuff. Thanks to new patrons this week, Randy L. Bixby, David Bradley, Tamara Kidd, Dan Jacobson, Isha Joachim, Katie Litwin, Anthony Mark Tilt and Quick Step Travel Guides. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for years or months. You're all amazing. You definitely help me keep coming back. So if you support the show on Patreon, you'll get that extra monthly Q&A, which I definitely have to record this week. (laughs) And I also share discount codes, behind the scenes information, early access and more. You can support the show with just a few dollars, euros, pounds, whatever your currency a month. And uh, I do mainly spend it on coffee. (laughs) I drink a lot of coffee. So you can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Joseph Nassis is the award-nominated New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of more than 50 books across horror, urban fantasy, supernatural thrillers, as well as epic fantasy and Arthurian mythos under other pen names. So welcome to the show, Joe. Oh, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Oh, yeah, I'm excited to talk with you. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into writing and publishing. Okay. Well, you know how superheroes have origin stories? Mm -hmm. I have a very strange writer origin origin story. I wrote my first novel in college to win a case of beer. (laughs) I had finished reading something, a thriller by a fairly popular thriller writer at the time, and absolutely hated it. Apparently wouldn't shut up about it because my roommate bet me a case of Bass Ale that I couldn't write a book, never mind write one that was of decent quality. So, you know, hey, gauntlet thrown down, challenge accepted. I worked nights in college for the security crew, and I sat in this little booth on the side of campus from midnight to 8 a.m. And so I used that time to write my first novel. And it went into a shoebox after I won my case of beer and uh, sat in that shoebox for 11 years until after I'd gotten married, my wife found it when we moved into a new house. She asked to read it, thought it was pretty good, convinced me to type it up because it had been written longhand on legal pads. <laughs> and so we used this old brother word processor. And this was back in in 2000. So uh, ancient history these days, but uh, I used this brother world processor to to print it up. We submitted it, a small press bought it, and then a few months later, Simon and Schuster came along and bought mass market rights, and that kicked off my career. Uh, interestingly, that book was the one that was nominated for my first time for the Bram Stoker Award for first novel, and for the International Horror Guild Award for first novel. So. It really kicked things off for me. It was a great start from a really weird <laughs> beginning. That, okay, that's crazy because, <laughs> I, I mean, so did you edit that book again to submit it to the publisher? I mean, it can't just have been the same draft of that won the case of beer that got you award nominations, a small press deal, and Simon & Schuster. <laughs> so I was very fortunate in having married a woman who is an exceptional editor. Oh, so, uh, nice she break. went through it. Yeah, she went through it first. Um, and then we submitted it. And then by the time Pocket bought it, the paperback division of Simon & Schuster, uh, the I was fortunate to have as my editor, Amy Pierpont, who was the executive editor for the entire line. And she then again went through and edited it. And I learned a ton in that process. And so I was, I'm extremely fortunate to have both of those ladies in my life at the right time to make this book a a success. Certainly wasn't any skill on my part at that point. (laughs) But that's just fascinating. Let's say to the listeners, don't expect that to happen with your (laughs) beer novel. (laughs) Not common, not common. (laughs) Not common indeed. But tell us, what happened from then? So this was 2000, I guess, 2002-ish, maybe the book came out. But I know you as an indie writer. Yes. So with your heretic series, that's how I kind of know you. So tell us how you got to indie. Sure. Heretic was actually the 
untitled second book in my Pocket Books contract. So that came out from Pocket Books in 2005. And then I couldn't sell a darn thing for about three years. And that wigged me out. I was like, okay, I'm not a one hit wonder, I'm a two hit wonder, but that's as far as I was going to get. So I kept trying to figure out my process and what worked for me. I ended up selling a trilogy overseas to Germany to a publisher called Dromenauer. And then that was bought by Tor. And those were my first hardbacks in the US. So I spent the first 10 years of my career or so with traditional publishing, Simon & Schuster, Tor Books, Gallery, Harper Voyager. I did a number of series for a number of publishers. I did 10 books for Gold Eagle, Harlequin. But that's when the Kindle came out, right around 2009. So I'd been in the industry almost a decade. And I found ebooks as a technology fascinating. And the idea that, oh, we suddenly have this platform where we can put out the work that we want to write when we want to write it in the form that we want to put it out in and not have to deal with gatekeepers and things of that nature. That that to me was what I think of as a disruptive technology. And that was great. And so I jumped full feet into that. And so I had this hybrid career where I, I continue to sell the New York. And I also do independent publishing. So when the rights to my Templar Chronicle series, for which The Heretic was the first book, reverted back to me in 2010, I put those out and then continued the series as an indie writer. And so those books have sold more than a million copies worldwide, have done very well for me as an indie writer, where they didn't find the the audience that I'd hoped they would have found back as a traditional uh, published work. So yeah, I've been doing both for a number of years now. And to me, diversification is one of the, the things you must do as an author these days. And so that was the foundation for me is keep writing traditional books and publish as many independent ones as I could. So do you always submit new work to traditional publishing or do you have these two parallel things going on? Two parallel things. I will definitely look and decide, okay, do I think this will work or, or not work as a traditionally published book? For me, I think of publishing as a business. I'm here to support myself and my family. So as crass as it may sound, money is a key. And so look at, at projects and decide, okay, where am I going to get the best return from my time and energy? And how will that work? So for example, I did a, an anthology project as an editor with Clive Barker and my co-editor, Del Howison. And we looked at Clive's novella Cabal and his movie Nightbreed, and we picked up the story where Clive left off and brought in a number of writers to tell the story of the Nightbreed as they disperse into the world at the end of of the film Nightbreed. That's not a project that really would have worked as well as an indie project because traditional publishing and obviously Clive's background and his popularity, that has the scope to reach a lot more readers through traditional publishing than it would, I think, through indie publishing. So we went that route with that particular project. You know, um, I did, uh, you mentioned the retelling of the Arthurian mythos. We, we took those and modernized them and made them modern urban fantasy and turned it into a shared world with 10 writers And that was the kind of project that just wasn't going to work as a traditionally published project. There's too many moving parts. Uh, Timelines were not something that traditional publishing could handle. And so that was clearly an independent publishing work. So, you know, depending on the project, that's the way I try to figure out which is going to be the best avenue and then pursue that avenue with that particular project. I love that attitude. And what's interesting is we were just chatting before we started recording and you told me that you've also recently done an MFA, which kind of made me gulp because (laughs) you've written all these books, you have decades of experience, and now you're going back to get an MFA. And I mean, many people who come out of MFAs are writing their first novels. So tell us why why do an MFA and what did you get out of it? So definitely a bizarre experience. I'll say that. Initially, I decided I wanted to get an MFA because I wanted to have a backup for my current job as a writer, as a teacher of writing. Uh, Having insurance is always a very good thing for a writer and having a job that provides insurance is a good thing. My wife is a flight attendant and she's been doing that job for more than 
35 years at this point, at some point she's going to want to retire. And so having this ability to be able to go out and say, okay, I'm going to get a job as a teacher teaching writing, that'll provide insurance. You know, all that was just kind of smart moves in terms of life. Um, So I decided, all right, I'm going to go get an MFA and I've gone through the process. I'm in my final thesis class at the moment. So I will graduate in May. And I have to say that it's been interesting because A, as you said, most of my fellow students haven't written a complete work and I've written more than, well, not just written, I've published more than 50 of them. So I, I didn't go into it expecting to learn a whole bunch, especially where MFA programs, Masters of Fine Arts and Creative Writing, are focused so much on literary fiction. Mm. And I don't write literary fiction. I mean, did you I, have I to write, though? Did you have to for the course? I I did not. Thankfully, I chose a course <laughs> that allowed me to write commercial fiction. I wrote an urban fantasy novel for my thesis, which hey, is right up my alley. That's what I've been writing for more than two decades now. So that was fun. I I came out of the course saying it's a shame that there aren't courses of this type that teach the nitty gritty of writing commercial fiction. You know, uh, I had attended a seminar at ASU, Arizona State University, not too long ago. And and the instructor at the seminar was talking about how, as a literary writer, he will do 10 drafts of his novels and he will throw the first nine away and each time start (laughs) fresh. And as a commercial novelist, that I mean, I wanted to stand up and scream. I thought that was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. And the time it takes him to write one book, I will have written 10 and sold all 10 and made money from all 10. So it's definitely two different mindsets. And so I did learn a lot about literary culture and literary fiction, but I came away with that feeling of, oh, it would be better if there was something that could um, help people who want to write commercial novels in a commercial fashion. And so I got together with my buddy, Tom Levine, who is a Random House author. He's done a number of books, both for Random House and Simon and & Schuster, and uh, in the primarily the YA culture. But then he went indie just like I did and has a hybrid career where he's been putting out indie books. And we sat down and we designed a course that we're going to launch next month called Storycraft. And it is totally focused on everything that wasn't in that MFA program <laughs> that I wished <laughs> there was there for people to learn. And so we're going to we're going to take our 40 years of combined publishing experience and put it all out there for anyone who wants to learn how to write a commercial novel and then either publish or sell that novel, depending on the route they want to take. Mm. And that just sounds fascinating to me. And also that it's almost like you took that MFA course and then wrote all the other material that you actually think is what you need. But it's interesting. Maybe you could give us a few tips and also clarify commercial. It does, does commercial mean genre fiction in this case? So you're, like you said, horror, urban fantasy, thrillers, epic fantasy. These are what many people consider genre fiction. So yeah, what is commercial and give us a few tips from Storycraft, sure. how to write it. <laughs> sure. Yes. I use commercial and genre fiction interchangeably. Um, and thank you for pointing that out because that could have been very confusing for people who are listening. Uh, yeah. Anything, you know, mystery, thriller, romance, urban fantasy, fantasy, westerns, horror, what have you. They're all genre fiction. They're all commercial fiction. They're not designed for college courses or all that, although they should be just designed for entertainment. And to me, the primary goal of a writer is to take the reader on an emotional journey. And another word for that is to entertain them. And so it's all about writing books of that type. And that's what I've been doing for what is this, 2023? So 23 years now. Um, Some tips. Here's one big one that I learned early in my career. So I have a kind of quirky way of writing. I don't write books in order. I will plot out an entire book and then I will write whatever chapter strikes me as interesting that day when I sit down to write. So I might write chapter three and then chapter 47 and then chapter eight and then chapter one and then chapter 23. And Once I've done all the chapters, I build the bridges and connect them all. Drives editors crazy, (laughs) but it, it works for me. When I started out, I tried to write a book a year as they taught you back in, in the early 2000s. And uh, I would write it in order. 
And I would write about a book a year because it would take me that long to write something, writing it in order. I don't know why, just it, it's like this block in my brain. It, I couldn't write well that way. The moment I gave myself permission to find a way that worked for me and to write the way I wanted to write, my career changed. I went from writing one book a year to writing four or five novels a year, which was a good thing because those were the days when I was writing books for the Rogue Angel series from uh, Harlequin Gold Eagle. And uh, we had a new book come out every two months. And there were six of us writing for the series. And every 60 days, a new book would hit in mass market paperback. And so I had to be able to write multiple books a year. And so being able to find that process, being able to trust what worked for me was the right thing to do was a huge change in my career. Mm. Um, the, the other major thing that I would say to people is that understand this is a business. You know, the days of writing for the sake of art from a commercial standpoint are over. Uh, you want to write for art's sake, go write and be happy and put the put the manuscript back in your drawer and don't worry about it. Uh, but if you want to write for a living, if you want to write so that you make money from it and provide for your family and things of that nature, then you've got to understand that it's a business, whether you're doing it through traditional publishing or whether you're doing it through independent publishing. And you have to understand as many aspects of the business as you can. I mean, if you're traditional publishing, understand how they select books, understand how books are sold to the major chains, understand the seasons of publishing and why they do what they do when they do it. If you're independently published, you know as well as I do that it's not just about writing. It's about marketing and promotion and understanding things like finances and taxes and all the fun stuff that comes along with being a businessman. But if you do that, if you understand those things, your career will be that much better uh, because essentially you're in control of it and being in control of it and having those those reins in hand directing the horses the way you want them to go is is a huge part of it all. Yeah, it's so interesting. You mentioned diversification earlier and obviously your this course is another example of one of your multiple streams of income. But can you <laughs> tell us like what are some of the ways that your business makes money in terms of, I mean, obviously you've mentioned the, some of the series are indie, some of them are traditional, you've got the course, but I, on your website, I saw Shopify, Patreon, translations. Yep. I mean, tell us about the other streams of your business. Certainly. Kind of as a foundation, I don't think of my work as a book. I think of it as intellectual property. Here's a character or a setting or a story that can be expanded in multiple directions. And so that's where I start. How many different directions can I take this particular work? So that looks at things like, I'm going to publish it in print. I'm going to publish it digitally as an ebook. I'm going to put out audio books. My work's been translated into seven different languages. So when I sell a book, I don't just look at the US market. Like I said, I've sold originals to Germany. I've sold originals to Italy. I translated books from... English and sold them to the Russian market and the Italian market and the Polish market and the Chinese market. These are all silos of opportunity where a writer can then earn more income, especially for work that's already been written. You only have to write the book once, but then you can sell it into a dozen different languages or more and get a payday every time you do that. So, so that's kind of the first set. What are my various formats that I can sell into? And uh, NFT digital collectible editions of the books is the latest one of those silos that I'm currently working with. But then I'll also look at, okay, what are the products that I can build out from those books? You know, I'm in the process of writing a Templar Chronicles role-playing game. So that'll be another avenue. I've sold comic book editions of my Templar Chronicles. So that was a, a third avenue. I have a Shopify store. So I sell everything directly from my website so if people don't want to deal with Amazon or any of the other various vendors, they can come direct to me. They'll get some decent pricing by the fact that they're doing that. They might get personalized signed editions, things of that nature. They'll get exclusive content that they can't get anywhere else from my Shopify store. So that's an avenue. The Patreon thing is a way of providing coaching advice and and providing an inside look at my work before it hits the market. So if you want those kind of perks, you want to see what's coming 
before it's all polished and spiffy and nice, oh, well, then come on over to the Patreon. And each of these things, again, like you said, they're silos of opportunity. They provide a means to, to reach fans in a new and different way. That holds true for merchandise as well. I sell t-shirts, I sell sweatshirts. We're going to be doing a line of journals, all of these based on my various series and the various characters or settings that come in those series. So it's not just a book. It's a piece of an intellectual property. And I want to exploit that property as many times and in as many ways as I possibly can. Mm. I love that. And you were talking before we started recording and I was like, how have we not connected before? I feel like we 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 think the same things about quite a lot of yep, stuff. Yep. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. But I do want to ask, you said we there. Are you a one person business? Do you have a team? Do you use freelancers? I, I tend to think of it as myself and my wife because she's my editor. So that's where the we comes from. Or it's the royal we, I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> but it, I am primarily a one a one man, one woman team between my wife and I. Uh, I do work with other writers. I've collaborated with other writers. And some of my pen names are a result of that collaboration. So for instance, I've written a series called the Hellstalker series with my buddy, John Mersh, who is famous for his Lost and, uh, Lost and Vampire series. And when we were casting about, it was hard to put both of our names on the covers. We tried that initially. That didn't work. So we came up with a pen name, J.J. Anderson, to write that series under. J is for John and Joe, J.J., John, Joe. And Anderson was a name at the top of the alphabet that was easy to remember and would have the books be in a good position in the bookstore if we sold them in that fashion. (laughs) So there's where pen name came from. So I have worked with him. I've worked with uh, Steve Savile. Um, I've worked with the 10 writers when we did the uh, Veil Knight series, which is a shared world series. So I've done a lot of collaborative work, but company wise, it's just me and my wife. Mm. And you do, I mean, we haven't really even touched on what you do for marketing, but do you, what do you do? And do you do all that yourself? I do all of that myself. I do your typical Amazon ads and Facebook ads and I try to connect with people on things like Twitter or LinkedIn to to build that audience. I have a newsletter that's been running for, oh, wow, close to a decade now, something like that. Um, and so, again, that's all part of the work of not just being an independently published writer, but just being a writer these days. I mean, publishing companies do so very little once that book hits the market that you got to learn to do all those things yourself. And so you you wear a lot of hats. Mm. And I guess for people listening, I mean, both of us, uh, you've been doing this longer than me, but we have just learned these things over time, yes. right? It's like, oh, look, here comes the Kindle. Let's learn how to get our books on that. It's not like we were born knowing all this stuff. You can learn it. It's just, It just takes time. Yeah, I, time and focus. You know, I mean, if something new comes along, and I think that's another key is you need to focus on certain things and not on everything. Uh, something comes along. It's like, oh, okay, I want to pursue that. Like I'm not on TikTok because I don't know how to do that. I don't have a lot of time to figure out how to do that. I don't like being on camera. So that's one of those things. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I just kind of said, okay, that's one thing I'm not going to pursue. I'll take the time that I might've used to pursue that and learn how to do Facebook ads better or something along those lines. And so, yeah, you need to focus. You need to figure out what you want to, to utilize and you can't possibly utilize everything. Uh, but you're right. It, you just learn it. Oh, I need to learn how to do this. I'm going to go learn how to do that and add that to my repertoire. But talking of things that you have been learning about, you are probably one of the few authors consistently doing NFT editions. You mentioned NFT digital collectibles earlier. So I've also minted, but you've minted with book.io. So tell us like, um, I mean, I don't want us to go into all the the technical background of blockchain and NFTs, because I've done quite a lot of episodes on this now. So just give your explanation of a digital collectible and then tell us a bit about why you wanted to go this way. Certainly. I've been collecting books, print books for a long time. And one of the joys of collecting print books was the limited edition or the lettered edition books where they only print so many, they're fancy, they've got ribbon bookmarks and beautiful end papers and different from the edition you walk into, say, Barnes and Noble and buy on the shelf. And so the idea of having something that's collectible 
works for me personally. And when this idea came along that, hey, you could do this digitally in a way that provides potential value for your fans, uh, that was something that I jumped all over. And, you know, blockchain as a technology, I mean, there's a lot of, of key benefits, but the one for me, for the reader is the fact that when you buy an NFT, you actually own the digital content you buy. Unlike, say, Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Kobol, where you are licensing the right to read that book. Uh, buying an NFT with a book built into the NFT, uh, which is what Book.io does, uh, gives them actual ownership of the digital content that they bought. And that was huge for me. Mm-hmm. And number two, it, you know, allowed that collectible edition. And one of the things Book currently specializes in is a collectible edition where they print so many copies, just like a collectible print edition. But each of those copies has a variant cover. You know, comics have variant covers. Well, now we have books with variant covers. And some of those covers are common and some of those covers are ultra rare, which can create value for those particular editions. And so as a way to, you know, hey, hey, you want to collect baseball cards of your favorite teams? Well, how about collecting the books of your favorite authors? That was something that I thought was really cool. And I dived in with both feet. Um, as you noticed, as you said, I've, I've minted my books, uh, with book IO. Uh, we did the first two as straight up mints. And then everybody who held the first two was airdropped the third book for free. And so now they have three collectible variants of my most popular selling books at the time. Mm, I love this. And I think what's interesting is the variant cover idea. And I did, when you were minting, I went and had a look and it's almost a bit like a lottery in that you kind of click to mint, but you don't yes. get to know what that variant cover is, right? Right, right. And that that's kind of the addicting part of it. It's like, okay, we know there's 2,500 editions available and some of those have covers where there's 400 copies of that cover. And some of those covers, there's only a single copy of those covers. Mm. But when you mint, it's a random lottery. You don't know what book is going to land in your wallet until it actually lands and you open it up. So it's this Easter egg kind of excitement. Oh, what am I going to get on Christmas morning kind of thing? (laughs) And that to me is fun. You know, I, I have a great time. I've minted books by authors that I like and Book also puts out public domain titles, but again, with that collectible edition with cover rarity. So I can get a copy of Oliver Twist or I can get a copy of Journey to the Center of the Earth with spectacular art that is of a collectible quality. And so that's been a lot of the fun involved in in doing this. I just, just yesterday, I came to an agreement with HarperCollins to do NFT editions of the first two books in my Great Undead War series. And so that's a big, big thing in the sense that, you know, okay, it's one thing for having indie authors to go and do an NFT, but now to have a major publisher decide, yes, we see this as a viable means to reach a new audience or or provide the book in a new way, and they're willing to partner to do that, it's going to be fun. Of all the books I've written in my career, the only two books that I do not control the rights to are the two books in the Great Undead War series, which was a, an alternate history World War I series with zombies. HarperCollins still controls those rights. Mm. So in order for me to do an NFT, I had to go back to them and negotiate that, that this was a thing that was good for both of us. But we just came to the agreement to do that yesterday. And so I'm super excited to see where that goes. That is interesting because I, I've i talked on this show, I've had, talked with a lawyer about this, and I think there's going to be an issue around NFT editions because essentially they are an EPUB or they're a PDF or they're a Mobi or they are whatever they are, yep. they are digital. So if an author has signed a contract for digital rights or ebook rights or audiobook rights, they can't do an NFT. So presumably you had to go back and say, look, I want the right back to do an nft edition and make that an exception from digital is that kind of how it worked yeah what we did is we did an amendment to the initial contract because they still controlled the rights to the series 
any final decision on what happens with that series is is going to come from them. So I made the pitch to them. Hey, we've been publishing this thing for so long. We've made X amount of money, but here's a new way of doing it. Let's reach a new audience. Let's revitalize this series because the series has been out since 2011, 2012 and Mm. publishing terms that's forever. So here's a new way to bring a new audience to the series. They didn't want to give the rights back to me. Mm. So I said, let's find a new way to exploit those rights. And so after a couple of months of negotiating, and we finally came to an agreement on how we would do it. And so now we'll do that and we'll both share in the profits from doing that. And that'll hopefully help us reach a whole new audience. And book three is hanging in the wind. So maybe doing this and bringing in more audience finally gets Harper Collins to pick up book three, or I'll do do it myself as a limited NFT edition or an mm-hmm. independently published edition. And again, it's all about revitalizing that intellectual property and using it in a new way. I, I think it's great you're doing that because I feel like there's a blockage. I mean, obviously there was the crypto crash last year and then also mm-hmm. we'll, we'll come back to AI in a minute, but I feel like the NFT space kind of went off the boil a bit, but I mm-hmm. also feel that publishers looked at it and were went, oh, that's interesting. And then they went, oh, too complicated. And depending on the blockchain you mint on and which currency, and of course there's a lot of legal stuff around coins. And so there's a lot to be worked out in this space, but I guess what it seems we both agree on, which is this is a really interesting thing in the digital collectible, I also believe will become a thing. It's just whether we will use the term NFT and what chains will shake out. So I, I feel like we're super early on this. Um, but I mean, Totally. You, yeah. How, how long do you think it will take before this is more like eBooks, like normal? Well, here's the interesting thing. One of the things that attracted me to Bookio, they just started their company last July. So, you know, what's that? eight, nine months, something like that. Mm. In the process, they've already minted 45 different books. They've brought in millions of dollars, but they have also partnered with first Ingram Content Group, which as Mm -hmm. you know, is the largest book distributor in the world. And then they also partnered with Bertelsmann, which again is another huge media conglomerate. So if companies like that are putting their weight and their money behind this emerging technology that made me sit up and say, hmm, let me take note of that. I know you've talked about this on your show before, but blockchain is one of those disruptive technologies. You know, 10 years from now, it's going to be as commonplace as the internet is. And I'm old enough to remember when the internet first came around and you'd get the dial up tone through your phone and it was text only and there wasn't any images. And here we are today. We don't even think about it. I mean, we just use it. Mm, And blockchain is going to be the same way. And so I think just like those publishers who said, oh, I'm not going to get involved in ebooks and then regretted it as soon as ebooks became popular, blockchain Mm. works will be the same way. And so getting in on the front end, I think, is beneficial to both authors and publishers. And we see companies like Book who are doing that. Now, obviously, they're not the only ones. I'm working with another company called The Quest of Evolution out of Portugal. And they're creating what they call collaborative crypto novels, where they'll bring in a writer, myself, I, uh, they'll bring in an artist and they'll bring in a musician and they'll create this three part project where the writer, the artist creates characters and character art. The writer will then create what they call spark verses or the beginnings of a story. And then those who come and buy the NFTs for that project then get the right to continue the story for a certain length of words. And so you become this collaborative process with the original writer, the architect of the story, the musician who provides the soundtrack and the artist who provides the art that becomes the actual NFTs. And then the story continues as those NFTs are sold and resold and move through the secondary market. So this novel can grow and live in a collaborative format That is very different than anything that we have available today. And so I think we'll see more use of the technology in that kind of creative fashion. And five years from now, they'll be making movies and and other television shows and books and all that through this kind of process. It's going to be fascinating. Mm, I totally agree with you. And I kind of think that it's more like architecture. You mentioned the internet. It's like we don't need to know the PIP protocols yeah. or whatever to use the internet. And I almost feel like people will be using on-chain 
stuff, but they won't even know. And they'll be using NFTs and they won't even know. Um, so I kind of think that's where it's going. But I, I think it's very interesting what you're doing. But let's return to AI, because what you talked about earlier, to 2,500 different covers on a drop. And mm-hmm. of course, you're not creating that many covers individually or paying individually for those covers. They are generated by uh, an AI. So talk about how you're using generative AI in your work. Sure. Um, And a yes and a no to your statement there. When we did the first drop of The Heretic, there were 1,200 different covers. 65 of those were single one-one covers. The the others were pulls of a various cover. And Book's in-house artist did those for me. And he used AI to get the base image. And then he uses Photoshop to tweak and, and make them clean in the way we want them. By the time we got to book three, I had learned enough about AI art to do those covers myself. And so I went in the same process that Billy used in the sense that, all right, we'll use text prompting to get the basic images, and then I'll pull them into Photoshop and add my changes and alterations to get them just the way we want. So it's both a, uh, a process where the AI is doing work, and it's also a process where a human is being involved in making changes or alterations to that image. AI as a concept is another Mm. one of those concepts that I find fascinating. I'm one of those people who can't draw a stick figure straight. So uh, (laughs) being able to create art in a way that is new and different was fascinating for me. I know there's pros and cons to AI art, and that's an argument that I think is going to go on for the next 10 years until, like anything else, it becomes commonplace. You know, that, that was the same argument that came along when Photoshop was first put out. Oh, is that that what we want to use for art? Well, yeah, it's become as, as secondary as, as anything else in life. Um, I, I don't understand the math behind it all, but like you said, I use a toaster every morning and don't understand how that works either. So <laughs> I, you know, I could, I can use this to do things. What it does though is it provides a new creative outlet for me to add to my intellectual property in a way that I haven't done before. So you and I were chatting before we got on about the Templar Chronicles tarot cards that I'm producing as digital collectible NFTs Hmm. through the use of AI art to get the base image. And then I alter that art in Photoshop. And those are just digital collectibles, something to go along with my books, something like baseball cards that people can collect. And I'm doing 22, the 22 major arcana cards from a tarot deck And each image is either a character or a scene from one of the books in the Templar Chronicles that correlates to what that card represents. So, for instance, the first card we did was the High Priestess, and that tends to correlate to feminine energy within the Templar Chronicles series. You know, the main... um, the main icon of feminine energy in the series is a character named Gabrielle Williams, the wife of the main hero of the series, Cade Williams. And she's not all that present in the first couple of books, but by the time you get to book four and, and through what will eventually be book 12, she plays a major role. So being able to have something collectible that signifies her and her role in the series uh, was just something fun and really interesting to do for me. And it gave me another creative outlet to approach this series and this story and what I'm trying to say with it. Mm, I love how experimental you're being in all these different ways. And it's fun, isn't it? That You've said this. It's, it's fun. And I, I did wonder if you would also comment on the AI, generative AI in text, which since like last November with ChatGPT and PseudoWrite and people are realizing, authors are realizing that this is not just art, this is also words. So are you being experimental there or any thoughts on how this will shake out? I'm being experimental, but for a reason that I never intended. So I got sick with COVID back in April of 2020. And I'm one of those people who has long COVID. I've been dealing with chronic fatigue, brain fog, and things of that nature ever since I got sick. And we're three years on now. And in the last two years, I produced one novel, which is crazy because normally I produce four to five a year. So it it really affected my ability to do my job. And there was a time when I was very concerned that I wouldn't write another book. I was quite concerned that my days as an author were done. And so I fell into AI art 
because of that. It gave me a way to to deal with my creativity that I didn't have to sit down and write 80,000 words on a given theme and stare at a blank page with my brain fog getting in the way all the time. Um, As time has passed, I've gotten a little better, and I'm confident now that I will continue to be an author. Like I said, I just finished a book for my thesis, so I'm back in the swing of things. But when I was in the depths of it, I started experimenting with ChatGTP because I was, I wanted to see, can I use the works I've already written and prompts to help get past what I was thinking of as writer's block as a result of the disease or as a Mm. result of the virus. So I, I did some experiments and, uh, I'm not sure how I feel about the results. I I have managed to get various models to replicate the style I write in, but it doesn't have the life that my writing usually has. And so then it's a question of, okay, take this and then edit it and see where that takes me. And all of that I'm still experimenting with. I, I don't think in you know the next month or two, it's going to radically change the way writers write. And I don't think it'll ever replace human oriented writing but it's certainly helpful i mean when it came time to write a sales page for my new course yeah i threw it into there and say you know let's see what they come up with and then i'll i'll edit that and so i think it has its uses i think it again it's a fascinating technology that has so many uses in so many walks of life that we're just seeing the smallest little bit of it at this moment But it's going to be one of those ubiquitous technologies that are just everywhere. And we won't think about it when it comes time to use it, just like we don't think about the internet or we don't think about Googling something, Uh, you know, Mm. you know, 20 years ago, the idea that a computer will be able to go out and find us anything we need in a matter of seconds, we would have laughed. And and now it's so commonplace as it's joined the common vernacular. So I think both AI art and AI text And even the stuff they're doing with AI video and sound and music and all that, it's all going to become new ways of doing things that will, like anything else, have pros and cons attached to them. Mm, But you're you're excited and you're going to try it out. I'm going to make use of things here and there where I can, definitely, because I think... That's what you do as an entrepreneur. You find new ways of doing things. You've, you know, the, the first people who use Facebook to put up ads for their ebooks, that was revolutionary at the time. Now it's so commonplace that it's just like, yeah, that's what you do. And so I think this will end up being the same way and I'll make use of it where I think it'll work. Mm, fantastic. So where can people find you and your books and also your course online? So you can find me at my website josephnassis.com. That's N-A-S-S-I-S-E.com. Uh, and that's where my shop at my store is. That's where my print books, my eBooks, I've got a blog where I talk about technology and things like AI art and all that kind of stuff. So all that's there. Uh, if you're interested in the StoryCraft course that is coming, you can go to storycraftcourse.com and there'll be a link there to sign up for our newsletter. And we'll be announcing the launch of the course. It will probably take place next month. So joining the newsletter and getting in uh, uh, to get notified of that will give you some bonuses and some benefits. So I urge everybody to do that as well. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Joe. That was great. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So I hope you found the interview with Joe interesting and that it's given you some inspiration for your craft and your author business. And I love how Joe is doubling down on both and also leaning into new technologies. So next Monday, I will be doing a solo episode on lessons learned from my Kickstarter. Now the fulfillment is pretty much finished. I've heard from people all over the world who have the signed hardbacks and the course is done. I still have consulting sessions to do, but they're spread over the coming year. So my lessons learned coming next week. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.